Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Kara Platoni. I'm the science editor at Wired.com, and welcome to tonight's virtual program with Inform at the Commonwealth Club. This evening, I am so happy to be in conversation with Mary Roach. She is the author of seven books, and she's just one of the most fun and delightful science reporters in the business. Um, if you've read her previous books, she's already uh, helped us get ready to go to Mars. She has taken us through the digestive tract, and she has shown us about life at the body farm. And now in her newest book, Buzz, When Nature Breaks the Law, she's taking us all over the world to learn about human and animal conflict and whether there's a way that we can peacefully coexist. So before we get into it, I just wanted to remind the audience that if you want to ask Mary a question, you can put your uh, questions in the chat box below and we'll try to get through as many as we can at the end of this program. So let's get started. Welcome, Mary. It's so great to talk to you. Oh, thank you so much, Cara. It's great to talk to you too. I'm so happy. Okay, well, now I know it is the tradition in interviews like these where you have to ask the author if they had some big dramatic event that gave them the idea for this book. But since chapter one is about bear attacks, God, I hope not. <laughs> Please I tell me with something else. <laughs> yeah, I know. I wish I had the the uh, the tidy and dramatic origin story. Like I was yeah, raised by wolves or attacked by raccoons savagely <laughs> in my backyard. But uh I've, I've pretty much had a fairly peaceful coexistence with wildlife. I got interested in this, you know, I'd finished one book and I was just doing that protracted grasping and groping where you're like, what am I doing next? I don't know. And I, I often write about the human body and I felt like I've kind of used that up. There's only so much turf, you know, there's so many parts <laughs> and there's only so many roachable parts. And I, so I was kind of looking a little further afield and I spent some time, I went up to the uh, the National Wildlife Forensics Laboratory in Na Ashland, Oregon, because I thought um, I thought there might be a, a book that might go around something that I'd heard about, which had was uh, the um, there's a woman up there who uh, established a hair library of all these endangered species. So it's not just one hair, but the guard hairs and the fluff hairs and the regular coat and the whiskers. And so just the idea of a hair library appealed to me. And she was also the author of a a guide for wildlife crime professionals on how to detect counterfeit versus real tiger penis. And so she was an interesting character. And I, I now know that if you ever have any dried alleged tiger penis, I can take a look and tell you I do if not, that's real but, or not. But thank um, you. Sure. It's just a little side skill that I have now. Uh, but anyway, when I was there, the uh, director of the lab said, uh, yeah, so you want to tag along on an investigation and kind of see how everything happens. Uh, no, absolutely not. If it's an open case legally, you cannot. And that's that. So um, I kind of regrouped and I started thinking, well, what if you turned it around? What if the wildlife was the perpetrator? And in that case, the science is uh, the human wildlife conflict. And that's a little branch pocket of science I had never heard of. And there are conferences and textbooks and people who are devoted to kind of figuring out how to help humans and wildlife coexist. And then I, so that was kind of how I landed there. And then I, uh, I, I came up upon this book, uh, 1906 book, The Criminal Prosecution and Capital Punishment of Animals, which is an insane 400 page, very bizarre book. But I, I realized, oh, I could do this. I could set it up by crime. So I've got you know, the, initially the felony crimes and crimes with quotation marks, because obviously animals are just following their instincts. They're not literally committing crimes, but I could break it down like, you know, we got manslaughter, murder, home invasion, and then the misdemeanors, trespassing, jaywalking, littering. So I, I just, it seemed like I could kind of structure the book that way and it'd be a kind of a more, make it a little more fun and relatable than just saying human wildlife conflict, which is, sounds kind of dry. Exactly. But it's not. Exactly. Yeah, it, so. sounds, it seems very roachable. It, yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So uh, there's kind of like an implied allegedly uh, with, with animal crimes. Uh, and when we say human animal conflict, I keep thinking, is it really a two-way street? Like, it, uh, do they, is, is it us projecting on them? Or, uh, or is this a problem that goes both ways? Uh, well, the conflict, it, 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 it typically turns out m m poorly for the animals uh, because the, uh, ultimately, Public safety is uh, is going to be the priority. So you know, see so if you have animals coming in uh, to your property or 
whatever it is, looking for food. Uh, and then they end up, um, you know, if it's an agricultural situation, you know, they, they're, they end up, they don't have a lot of rights and they, uh, <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't typically go all that nicely, but, um, are you, were you asking like the conflict, is there two different kinds of conflicts or? No, I was just thinking that like, Animals are, like you said, they're, they're kind of doing what animals do, and they're also right. doing what man, animals have always done, but we're the ones who change all the time. You know, we're the ones who yes. build stuff. We affect yeah, the climate. Yeah. We There's 8 billion of us now, and yeah. uh, it, it seems like uh, we we change, and then they adapt, and then we get right. mad at them, which is just yes, gaslighting, exactly. right? I mean, yes. that's yeah, exactly yeah, yeah, what yeah. it is. <laughs> no, exactly. I mean, these animals are, I mean, our range is expanding, and their range talking about bears, some of these large mammals that in the last, you know, a hundred years ago were just the populations were decimated by bounties, by, you know, airdrops, poison meat. I just, I mean, just, it's kind of a free for all kind of Wahoo annihilation campaigns. Mm -hmm. And that all shifted around, you know, the middle of the last century when uh, uh, the environmental movement, the animal welfare movement started to gain traction and the public kind of shifted its attitude and it wasn't okay to just go in and wipe these animals out so happily they've made a recovery these populations of bears and wolves and coyotes to the point where they're now kind of getting all up in people's business again and now we're heading back into uh, conflict but yeah it's 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 almost always um our change and our doing that is creating the conflict animals are just doing what they've always done and now suddenly we've plunked down in the middle of their range you know up in the mountains around Aspen, just sort of providing new sources of food, entire dumpsters behind restaurants full of, you know, sustainably grown, <laughs> lovely organic produce for them to feast upon. So, you know, why wouldn't they? Uh, so yeah, it's, it is, it is very much our fault in a sense. So one of the things that's really fascinating about this book is um, you get into the idea of what's a pest and what's an animal that we love and we want to protect. And I think there must be at least a hundred different animals in this book that are considered pests that at some point in history, um, including a lot of animals I, I think of as being extremely adorable. Um, I'm wondering, did you ever find sort of a through line for what makes an animal a pest to us and what makes an animal something that we, we care about and we love, we want to bring into our home? Oh, well, uh, sure. A pest, you know, a uh, pest is a term that gets applied by somebody who is either irritated or harmed by the animal or their bottom line is affected. Um, agricultural pests, you know, agriculture uh, between the birds and the rodents. I mean, if you're trying to grow food, um, those animals are considered pests. I, I, um, yeah, there's, there's lists of wildlife that have been, that are considered by the USDA or, and, or the department of public health. Uh, uh, there's a long list of I things. I actually that have it. Yeah. <laughs> I it, got it yeah, because I it, loved it, it so much. It is. It, yeah. And I'm like, really chipmunks, bobcats. I mean, but they're depending on, you know, where they're living and what they're, what they've decided to, to, you know, uh, feed on they are you know or chew through in the case of rodents um or they end up they end up causing somebody headaches and then they become called you know they become a pest i don't yes. like yeah i mean read some of those out it's kind of astounding okay this is a one of my favorite and this is lines just in the book. just in america Yes, and just yeah. recently too. Okay, so here are some of the species the EPA, the um, and the USDA and the Department of Health and Human Services consider pests: chipmunks, bears, raccoons, foxes, coyotes, skunks, flying squirrels, tree squirrels, little brown bats, rattlesnakes, coral snakes, cliff swallows, crows, house finches, turkey vultures, black vultures, and mute swans. And that is not a comprehensive list <laughs> at, at all. That's uh, that's just a few of them. So yeah, yeah, uh, we seem to be irritated by just about everything out there. <laughs> so the solution to 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 pest and pest eradication is, of course, science. And I feel like you, we can read this book sort of as a history of technological innovation and pest eradication. So you sort of take us through the pre World War II era where it was mostly brute force and trickery. You know, sending somebody into a field to do something startling, and then uh, and then in the fifties and the sixties, it's more about mass poisoning. Uh, yes. 
the, it's the era of better living through chemistry. Yes. And then uh, more recently, there's all these kind of high tech things. There's drones, there's, there's lasers. lasers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you really, if you look at the, the, the timeline of um, military armamenture, military technology, it's amazing. It kind of like pest, pest control and um, military weapons kind of have followed this same, just this parallel path, even to the extent of the national, the, the, the national wildlife research laboratories. Well, there were two of them back then uh, working together and during World War II uh, with the uh, division nine of the, uh, it was a, a, a the National uh, Defense Research Committee, if I have that correct. So the two of them actually working hand in hand and the division nine was the chemical weapons. So the uh, the people in chemical weapons were uh, making suggestions for the oh, gosh. wildlife <laughs> people uh, because what happened during World War II, they, the supplies that were necessary to make rat poisons were uh, were cut off. So they were looking for a different, uh, the wildlife people were looking for a substitute. So they're like, hey, you guys in the chemical warfare division, what do you got that's maybe too nasty to use in, <laughs> in oh, human and human warfare? <laughs> Would we try it out? So there was a pro, yeah, pro, kind of a co interesting cooperation um, between between the two, uh, and yeah, it, it, there was the chemical era, and then the, the drones and the lasers, and um, and 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 I uh, the next you know the, the the end point that I would love to see for both of those is coexistence, and in in, in the wildlife world, we are seeing. Um, organizations that are promoting that and they're actively trying to bring both sides together to have conversations and to listen to each other and try to understand the issues. And that it, that's really hopeful for me. So, you know, if we are, if they're both on a parallel path, I'm like, well, maybe that'll be the case with warfare too. Maybe coexistence, maybe we'll all get along. <laughs> um, I, I definitely want to talk to you about coexistence because it's part of one of the favorite, my favorite chapters in the book is about um, the is about your discussion of coexistence. Uh, but I don't want I don't want to give it away quite yet. Yeah. First, I was wondering, for people who haven't read the book, if you could give us a couple examples of these technical solutions to to animal control. And I was wondering if you might pick one that you thought worked out pretty well. It's, it's pretty okay. Sure. And then one that was just like absolutely a bomb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the one that I like very much is the. Um, it's in the jaywalking chapter. And the uh, creatures that are jaywalking are ungulates. Um, I do talk about elk and camel and moose, but that's sort of a different section. Deer, for the most part, in this country. Uh, deer are, is a tremendous number of, of, of people who are injured, uh, not so much when they hit the deer, but they swerve to avoid mm -hmm. the deer. Not good for the deer, not good for drivers. Mm -hmm. and, and so I spent some time with a researcher who was trying to figure out why is it the deer, the deer in the headlights issue? They stand there and they look at the headlights and they don't get out of the way. Why is that? And how can we help them? And he, he explained to me why they do, you know, the, the theory behind why they just kind of stand there has to do with how animals perceive cars mm -hmm. and cars moving toward them. They, they perceive a car, you know, any large object. If you're a deer, a large thing coming towards you, you, you know, it's, it's a predator and how you deal with predators is you look at it and you watch, you know, as it comes towards you, it gets bigger, you know, it looms, it gets bigger. And then you are able to intuit and sort of calculate how much time you have to get out of the way before you're going to get hit. But at night, when it's just two pinpoints of light in the distance, they don't loom perceptively. They just, you're just kind of, the deer's kind of going, there's two bright lights there, dead, boom. Just does, they do, it's very hard to, to see that it's hard for the animal to uh, process that that is a thing coming closer. So the idea uh, that this guy, uh, Travis DeVault, National Wildlife Research Center, had was to uh, uh, install an aftermarket light bar on the front of a car or truck that illuminates the grill, the front of the car. Mm -hmm. So now the animal can see this is not just two little pinpoints of light. It's a vehicle getting bigger, coming towards you. So that, um, and that has seemed to, to help. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's just been patented and it's not for sale yet, but I, I, I liked that. It was just like somebody actually s sort of thinking about why does an animal do, do that? A lot of the best solutions come out of a deeper understanding of the animal's sensory system, the animal's 
behavior? Is it a predator? Is it a prey animal? Um, how does it behave and why? So um, wildlife biology plays into these things quite a bit. So I thought yeah. that was a nice one. And did he consider changing the color of the light too? To be something he did, like yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. It, it emits in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, which is um, where deer see best. Like deer can see really well at dusk. You know, for them, it's like high noon because they've, they've got more receptors in that in that area and, and less so on the red orange. Mm-hmm. So they, um, they, they're they able to per- perceive if somebody's sneaking up on them, a predator that is, uh, because whereas you and I would be kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of murky out there. Uh, the deer can see just fine. Yeah, that was, a, that was very cool. That was a very smart solution. Yeah, it was also, um, he, he mentioned how there's, um, laundry detergents have these brightening agents that make whiter whites, right? Uh-huh. What they are really is, is in the ultraviolet range. So if you wash as a hunter, wash your camo gear <laughs> in one of these <laughs> detergents that makes whiter whites, that, that you're actually sort of glowing for the deer. So, um, ha ha. <laughs> yeah. Jokes on you. Probably Jokes not, on who, you. not who they were targeting with that laundry detergent. A, precisely. Okay, so give me one that just... It didn't work out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm, There's a bunch of those in the category of, okay, we have this nuisance animal and we'd like to be rid of it. Why don't we import a predator that will go around and just scarf up all of these invasive, all of these annoying animals. Um, And the, Mm -hmm. the extreme of that, well, there, a simple example, Hawaii had rats in the sugarcane fields brought in mongooses or mongeese. I'm not sure the plural. Of that, I don't know. I think it's. I think you have your choice. I only use mongies. I, I like that better. Mongies. Anyway, um, but someone overlooked the fact that one one of them, the rat, is nocturnal and the mongoose is diurnal. So, you know, they brought in the mongoose. The mongoose are like, <laughs> I hear there's rats here somewhere, but I've never actually seen one. <laughs> Ships passing in the night. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, and New Zealand has had a heck of a time with that. Uh, going back t- to. Um, there were these, when people emigrated from Europe to, to New Zealand, there were these acclimatization societies that would bring in animals to kind of make the woods more familiar, or they wanted deer to hunt because they like to hunt. So they, they imported animals. And one of the things they imported was rabbits. And the rabbits, because they had no, uh, no land predators, the rabbits just multiplied like crazy and were just devouring the the fields and crops. Uh, So those good people decided, well, let's bring in some stoats because we know they're, you know, they're a vicious uh, predator. They can take on an animal larger than themselves. So they imported all these stoats and uh, also bred some feral cats and stole cats from people in the cities, but they let them go in the countryside, you know, and this, and the the stoats kind of looked around again, um, saw the rabbits, a lot easier to just pick these nice eggs that these flightless, strangely flightless birds are laying and uh, these eggs are all over the place. So um, the number of species that are gone or endangered or threatened, not just birds, but reptiles too, is, is staggering because the stoats have, have thrived really well. Uh, and the, um, they've also brought in possums to establish a fur trade and those also plus the rats that jump off the ships. So, you know, this, these land masses that had no, you know, no natural predators for, um, for these birds uh, now are kind of overrun. And so okay. that, uh, you know, it was, it, uh, I guess it seemed like a good idea at the time, but uh, it's always, you know, those unknown knowns, unknown no, unknowns. Just, what is I it think, Rumsfeld said? The unknown unknowns. The known unknowns, I think no, it was. Yeah, that. That, anytime, um, anytime your solution is a possum, I think you're just you're headed for trouble. <laughs> it reminds me of that like really ghastly children's nursery rhyme about the lady who swallowed a fly, and then you know she swallowed exactly. the dog to catch yes. the cat, to catch the rat, to catch the, whatever. I is had it, the same thought. Yeah. yeah. It, so, um, a, in all of this innovation between different different ways of eradicating pests, how are we slowly moving towards improvement in any dimension? Like, are we getting more humane? Are we getting better at killing the animal we mean to, and not everything else? Or, or is that uh, sort of a wash? Uh, well, there's there's technology uh, going on in the realm of um, genetics, something called gene drive. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and that's something 
where rather than, you know, say you were to do this in New Zealand, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that uh, I think the first place they may try it is some of those islands that have a, have seabirds, but also rodents and the rodents are killing all the seabirds and, you know, small isolated islands. <clears throat> so rather than dropping a hail of poison, that's just, you know, a 1080 is often what's used. Um, they're talking about doing something where you would um, you'd make a genetic modification such that the animal only gives birth to males, so no mm -hmm. females. So that's going to be, um, and, and and also the gene drive element is that it would be passed on much more quickly. You know, instead of fifty percent, would be all the offspring would have this. So um, that would quickly put a, um, a <laughs> lower the population. Uh, but the first thing first you have to kind of it flood the, the island with these gene drive specimens. Right. So you, so initially uh, you're going to kind of make the problem worse. So probably there'd be, you know, they will probably do a poison campaign and then introduce the gene drive animals as a um, kind of a mop up and prevention going forward. Uh, and, and it's something, you know, it's something for, you know, for, for an isolated island somewhere like that, I could kind of see that. Um, what makes me a little uncomfortable is is that very that list that you read out of all these animals that are considered pests. And if if the decision is made purely according to um, what is most damaging to agricultural production, you know, if that's if that's the if that's how the decisions are made, then that's a frightening thing because mm -hmm. so there's so so many species that. Uh, find it convenient to take the, you know, the produce or, you know, that's a fish farm. You've got the cormorants that are taking the fish. It just, the, you, where, where would it even end? Yeah. So gene drive is fascinating, but sort of terrifying technology. It's the yeah. very, the very cutting edge of this evolution of pest control and getting into yes. altering the genome of a species, uh, you know, which really, uh, I think you can have a really interesting ethical debate about when should we yeah. say God. I, I was yeah. just going to say that one of the species probably other people have heard about other than um, controlling mice is controlling mosquitoes. And the yes. argument for that has always been, well, mosquitoes carry diseases that are so bad. They carry Zika and malaria mm -hmm. and dengue fever that it's okay to eradicate the mosquito. They're, they're that bad. But I, I don't know. Do the people that you talk to feel like there's, the, it, that is ever okay to say the species does not? Well, the, what they're talking about right now is, is confined to, um, situations like I was talking about an island where you have invasive species that are destroying to the point of extinction, the native the biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And because it's an isolated, there's also, I mean, I, I don't want to get into the, the specifics of the genetics, but there are kind of ways to um, try to, to, to limit it to the, like, so it's not going to get out into the general world, po global population of mice. There's, there are, uh, there are ways to kind of manage that, but Again, the unknown unknowns or whatever Rumsfeld said uh, <laughs> is always, uh, yeah. And the other thing uh, is that so far it has proved to be pretty tricky to do uh, mm -hmm. gene drives. Like it's not, the, the sequence isn't copying that well. There's also been an issue with uh, you know, the, the um, gene drive specimens uh, are slightly different than the, the specimens that they're going to be breeding with. And sometimes, and they may not even, speak to each other. They may not even, they may be different enough that they wouldn't, they wouldn't even breed. Huh. So there's, there, there's been, um, it, it, it seems a little, uh, like it, it's not off to a fast start, which is good because I think that the ethics need to be thought through and that people need to have more conversation. A lot of conversation is going on about it. And, um, anyway, it, it isn't to, it is not to the point where it's being considered as pest control for agriculture, but I don't know some of the work is being done at the National Wildlife Research Center, which is owned by the USDA. So my feeling is that the endpoint would be pest control, and that's where things get hairy. Well, let me ask you about um, this. Is one of my favorite uh, chapters, and it's a different kind of uh, solution. It's about the Midway Atoll, which the U.S. Navy is trying to use as an airstrip during the 1940s, and it's just absolutely covered in albatrosses, albatry. Uh, and I don't want to spoil for people who are going to read it all of the increasingly hilarious and desperate things that the, the Navy <laughs> tries in order to get rid of these birds, because you, you really don't want birds on your, your airstrip. You don't want them getting sucked into an, an engine that's very serious for everybody. Um, 
But in the end, what happens is the Navy leaves. It, it, that island is now a, a nature mm -hmm. preserve. And I'm wondering what you think about this as a solution, the idea that maybe sometimes we have to just give up. Um, I think that they left for other reasons. I don't think they left because of the album. I don't think they're like, you know what? You guys, we've hassled you enough <laughs> and we feel kind of bad. You know what? We're just going to leave. Just to the island. You take it. Um, it was closed for other reasons. It was a you know midway, you know, halfway between the between California and Asia. It was it was considered very strategic? And, well, I mean, it still kind of is, but but there, um, I'm not sure the exact reasons why they they eventually closed it, um, and maybe it had something to do with the albatross. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a lovely outcome because it's now uh, it's now just seabirds. It's just the albatross are like. Finally, those people are gone. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, 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 that was, yeah, it's a, the albatross. I love them. I think about this all the time uh, when it comes to climate, climate change, which is not necessarily about species, but it's about thinking where people should be. You know, we have yeah. this concept of nature preserves, which are usually, it's usually like parks that we set up in someplace remote where there's not a lot of houses, there's not a lot of business. There's, we don't have to give anything up. But with climate change, I think a lot about, do we need to seed some ground and say, this is just not a place where people should live anymore. I yes. guess in, in that case, it's a little too risky. Um, but the idea of giving up space and turning it back over to the natural yeah. world, it, it seems profound. And also, I, I don't know if anybody would actually ever do it. I don't know either. I mean, I think things would have to, things would have to change considerably before anybody would. But you know what's interesting? Um, in India, when and, and I think maybe in Nepal as well, there have been places where, um, and, and not that it's being done for the sake of the animals, I believe it's being done for the sake of tourism, but sanctuaries have been set up and the government has, uh, you know, wildlife preserves, fairly large, have been set up and the government has, has compensated, has paid people uh, uh, quite reasonably, uh, paid people to relocate. Just kind of interesting. Uh, again, not done for the right <laughs> reasons, done because they want to uh, encourage tourism. But uh, I mean, it would it uh, would it would be lovely if that ever happened. If we said, you know, I know this could be a great place for a ski resort, but let's first look at, at almost as like an environmental part of an environmental impact report. You know, couldn't there be a, like a although maybe that is part of. EIR. It's like, what, 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 are, what will be the impact on the wildlife here? And, and is it even, should it even be allowed? Right. Uh, so. Yeah. Exactly. Well, um, so you kind of hinted at this before, but I, um, I wanted to talk about the idea of coexistence. And you, I don't think it's giving too much away to say that there's a, a chapter in which you go to the Vatican to ask about their rat problem. <laughs> and, uh, and, and in doing so, you end up in this lovely conversation with a Vatican bioethicist. And uh, it kind of strikes me that uh, coexistence is sort of the middle ground be between trying to, tr trying to wipe something out and also just going away. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit just what, what exactly is coexistence? Uh, well, the coexist I mean, the guy at the, the Pontifical Academy for Life, um, uh, he, he's not really involved. This wildlife is, is not something he spends his days thinking about. <laughs> he, he foolishly agreed to see me and he was very <laughs> patient with me. But I just, you could just tell just looking at him and he was like, who let her in here? <laughs> because, you know, as I wanted, you know, I, I had this ridiculous idea that maybe I could um, have an audience with the Pope and have a conversation because Pope, you know, the Pope, it's Pope Francis, his, his kind of patron saint or whatever his name, his namesake is uh, Francis of Assisi, you know, the kind of the OG animal activist and, mm -hmm. you know, a man of the earth. And, and, um, and Pope Francis has written these beautiful encyclicals on, on caring for our home planet. So I really, I, you know, I had this because I was going to report on the, the gull situation at St. Peter's, which <laughs> we don't have to get into. I thought, well, while I'm here, maybe I'll talk to the Pope because that's the kind of stupid things that I think <laughs> when I go places. And it was hard enough just to get a conversation with the, the guy at the Pontifical Academy for Life, but I did. And, and um, he was very patient with me. And he, you know, he's a, he was a wise man. He said some interesting things, but he's, I mean, coexistence uh, to, to really make it work. It's a partnership between two organizations. For example, the uh, 
um, National Wildlife Research Center, which is part of USDA, and NRDC, Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, the more, more typically, what happens is NRDC will sue wildlife services. Um, there's been an effort to bring these people, the heads of these, you know, the, there's a carnivore person at NRDC and um, somebody at National Wildlife Research Center who have sat down and had conversations and have actually managed to get funding for hiring uh, people to do non-lethal solutions, mm. not just pay lip service to it, but, you know, and, because there are people, um, the NWRC is part of Wildlife Services, which is the arm of USDA, which uh, gets called in if somebody's got predators killing their livestock and they want the predator killed. So the the, the people from Wildlife Services will come in and, and they may say, you know, you could build a better enclosure for your livestock at night. You could, there's various things you could do. Uh, there's, you could graze the sheep differently, but they used to just say the stuff and now they're actually hiring people to mm. help do it. And that in, 10, in 12 states, uh, and there's a, they've hi, uh, made specifically uh, positions available for non-lethal conflict resolution specialists. And that was hope, very hopeful to me. And the fact that those two entities were having conversations and that there are now several um, organizations that are committed to bringing people together to have dialogues, uh, large conferences that bring in um, people from agriculture, people from li uh, ranch, you know, livestock production, environmental people who are concerned with the environment, animal welfare people, and they s s spend two or three days having conversations. And hopefully, you know, when they go back to their own corner, sort of implementing some of this. And also, the other hope is that those folks can sort of um, be form a kind of body that would inform legislation. So the legislation isn't just, um, let's put it out there for the people to decide because people vote by uh, emotion or by their own personal financial interest. Um, so, so the, you know, things end up on the ballot that you know, that not necessarily the, the the right solution or an effective solution. So if you if you can have these cooperative groups that reflect kind of both sides of the divide, um, that that would that would be a hopeful thing. Did you uh, in your travels meet anybody who was sort of just putting this principle into practice in their everyday life? Not somebody who was you know part of a government agency or following a policy, just somebody who had learned to yeah, coexist yeah, no, with I, their pest. Yeah. Um, I, several people, I, I, I was at the, um, the vertebrate pest conference a couple of years ago. <laughs> uh, cause that's what I am as a journalist of vertebrate pest. <laughs> that is, that is what I do. That's me. Um, but I, I, I just ended up talking to this woman who is a rancher, but she's also active with a coyote. I think it's called the coyote project, which is a, uh, she, she's a, she's an, both an activist for on behalf of coyotes and uh, a rancher and um, pretty unusual, mm -hmm. pretty unusual combination. Um, and then there were some, you know, I, I, I was really heartened to meet when I was out in Colorado, uh, the National Wildlife Research Center. I went and um, spent some time with a man who has a, a very large feedlot. And this is where people send their cattle to be raised uh, in the, you know, different diets for different, you know, if it's a dairy, cow versus a breeding cow or meat cow. So he has this, you know, huge mountains of gr different types of grains and you know, obviously rodents, uh, uh, they're out in the open. And I was imagining like, what does this guy do with it? I mean, he must have this massive infestation of rodents. And so I went out there um, to, to talk to him and, and I love this guy because he's, he's, he gave me a lot of hope because he's, he's not an organic farmer. He's kind of big ag. But I said to him, you know, what do you do? You, how much of this grain do you lose to, to mice, to, to animals? And he said, well, this, it comes in a 15 ton lot. And if mice eat 50 pounds of that, I'm not going to know. The wind probably blows away more than that. So it's not really a big deal. He had this just sort of acceptance. It wasn't just, a, it wasn't really as formal as coexistence. It was just, it's the cost of doing business. Right. Exactly. And I'm okay. I'm okay with it. I've got 
I've got um, cats, you know, they kill some of the mice. We got owls um, and I've got fox, the foxes come around and that's why we don't have rats. So it was, you know, without speaking the jargon of sustainability and coexistence, et cetera, he was kind of practicing it. And I, uh, I don't know, I just, I, it, it made me feel sort of hopeful. And yeah. Uh, um, so, yeah, there are, there are people out there. I mean, and, and I, I don't know how many of them uh, feel the same way as him. I would imagine that you end up at that spot because the solutions that, you know, there were birds flying over his eyes and overhead. And I said, do you do anything to scare the birds away? And he said, you can hire people to shoot off, you know, pyrotechnics and scare them, but they just come back. And, you know, it's, it's seasonal. It's only, you know, certain time of the year they pass through. So it's not really a big deal. So we had this wonderful kind of ex- acceptance of uh, the situation. And, uh, and, and I think we could all, we could all do to um, absorb a little bit of that. I think people are very quick to call exterminators, very quick to call. So just, 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 they just let's make the problem go away. Well, the problem is, is actually, it's an animal. Uh, so, um, and there are ways to, to, you know, prevent the problems from happening in the first place by changing your own behavior. Like maybe you don't have to have a cat door that the raccoons come through mm-hmm. and eat your cat food. And maybe you could plug up some of the holes along the eaves where the squirrels are getting in. Uh, there, there's just, uh, and there's resources in the back of the book. I direct people to a humane society. The United States has a really good species by species guide to what's vexing you. Here's some stuff to do. So um, <laughs> I have to confess, Mary, that when I was setting up this uh, the the computer I was stacking it I was stacking some old books under it and a silverfish popped out and I thought oh no gotta coexist coexist with silverfish so uh, we're coexisting but he is existing outside now <laughs> yeah uh, okay so I think that silverfish are the exception I think he, I think everybody can kill silverfish I don't know what is it about them why are they so they're freaky. creepy they're so creepy I I'm I mean I I definitely take the spiders outside. I don't, I don't kill spiders and I eat the flies. I try to shoo them out, but the, the fruit flies and the, the silver, but especially the silverfish. I'm sorry, silverfish. Like, yeah, yeah. I felt like it was fair. He's outside. But I, I, when I was reading the book, I was trying to think, is there any technology that's like really good at encapsulating this idea of coexistence? And I think my favorite one that you mentioned was the idea of the wildlife overpass, which is oh yes, you know, like over the, over yes. the, it's, it's, it's basically, yeah, it's an overpass for wildlife, right? It's and, an overpass for wildlife. And um, yeah, I mean, the best thing we could do is before we put a freeway in, take a look. At, to talk to somebody who knows this land. Is there a, um, a, a kind of animal that has to get from point A to point B, say, mm-hmm. because they uh, change elevations over the course of the year to find a food source, or they go to a certain place to mate and they have to cross the road? We'll look into that first uh, before you build your freeway. That would be the ideal, but that never happens. Uh, so people realize that after the fact, when uh, animals start getting hit in big numbers. Uh, so yeah, these, and there's wonderful, you can go on YouTube and see all these um, wildlife camera f- footage of animals uh, using these overpasses. They're, they're, they're expensive to put in um, and they, they're, they're great for, um, like I was talking about, an, a species that in large numbers tends to move in a known direction and, and cross in a, a fairly limited span of road uh, with deer, uh, you know, the certain times of the year, deer are running around looking to mate. They're looking for food. They're just, you know, there's, you'd have to put an overpass like every, every five <laughs> miles, you'd need a deer overpass. So, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a solution for that kind of animal, but for animals that move in herds or that, that migrate, you know, in big groups at certain times of the year to mate, um, you can, you can dig under sometimes there are uh, like toad and frog tunnels, I believe underneath. What? Where you can go over, yeah, 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 and um, yeah, that's a wonderful. They, they have a, they have that a lot in Europe, uh, but but and uh, but more so here. You know, they're, it's starting to catch on here, and that's a yeah, that's a lovely thing to do. Yeah. It's kind of the tech equivalent of getting a barn cat. It's sort of passive. It's low yeah. tech. You don't really have to. People don't have to be involved. Just you know, just yeah. leave, leave it alone. Yes. Um, so let me ask you a little bit about the uh, the the roachable book. 
Um, one of one of the delights of reading one of your books is that you take us on this a tour through this world that we know nothing about, and we meet people with super cool jobs that we've never heard of before. And you're always kind of like a minor character in the background with your notebook, like standing too close <laughs> to somebody and saying like, I'm just gonna follow you around. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's me, vertebrate press. <laughs> vertebrate press. And it's this very kind of personal up close style of journalism that sort of depends on you being able to talk your way into the room or into the ride along and then being there to sort of make charming observations about not charming things. And, um, I'm wondering if the pandemic got in your way at all. Did it? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm travel? so, so fortunate in that I was done with most of the research when this hit. There was one chapter. I had a chapter I was going to report in Toronto that had to do with raccoons. And I remember it was March of that year, the year. Uh, and I remember talking to the person at United Airlines and he said, no, the border is closed. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I remember saying to this man, well, my deadline is uh, end of May. So if I could, it'll be open by early May, right? Like I actually thought from March to May, oh yeah, this will all be over. I had no idea. Um, so I was very lucky because I couldn't, it would utterly derail me. I couldn't do, I would have had to just set it aside. And I don't know what that's like to, you know, book us, interrupt us. I don't know how that would work. Uh, so, uh, and I, fortunately I had some uh, projects that I could do from home that didn't involve travel. Like I did a children, a young reader adaptation of packing for Mars, um, uh, I updated stiff, just was just stuff I can do on the phone. So it, it, I was very lucky. I don't know how people managed who are in right in mid stride reporting a book. I mean, people who travel for their research. Yeah, it was reading the book was so re refreshing because there were things like crowds and international <laughs> things that seemed so far away. And then two thirds of the way through, there's a Zoom call. And I thought, oh, no, <laughs> but yeah, that's, yes. that's what made me wonder. Yeah, no, the Zoom call. But I that was my first ever Zoom call. And and and, it, it, and I the, the woman I was calling it, the screen kind of froze. And it was one of those, you know, situations that you have but it as the you know as time passed and I went and you know reread the book I thought that scene feels so dated to me now that we were all like figuring out oh how does this work but um but yeah that was um that was in fact not during zoom that was before it's oh, just wow. because I I um I didn't you know uh, uh it, it wasn't the focus of the whole chapter so I didn't travel to Appledore Island I kind of wish I had it would have been kind of amazing I'm I'm kind of excited though that there is a there was a lost chapter. It made it made me wonder if there was something that couldn't happen. Um, this this last eighteen months has for people been both maybe their most the most indoor time of their life, but also the most outdoor time yeah. of their life. There's been this like such a surge of interest in camping and hiking and stuff like that. I'm wondering, do you think did the pandemic change the way we think of nature at all? Um, well, I think uh, there was a tremendous increase in the number of people who. Uh, who go bird watching? I mean, I, I'm a I've been a nerdy birder since I was in. <clears throat> my mom was a bird watcher, kind of a passive. She'd hang a bird feeder, and you know we'd watch from the chairs in the living room. She didn't go outdoors and bird. She's or you guys can come to me. And I'll, <laughs> I'll watch you. I'll feed you. Uh, but um, you know, I know that the, the birding has taken off, and 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 it's lovely because I, I just you see so many more people out in park. I mean, during the pandemic just the number of people out in nature uh, even to the point where it's just a, it was almost too much the trails were so crowded yeah and, the, I, the, and backpacking we, we couldn't go it was everything was overrun yeah I actually I um we did an article about this at Wired that birding became so popular and social yeah. media was driving so much attention to rare birds that people were sort of showing up and overwhelming yeah. uh, animals um I don't know uh weir weirdly uh, from the point of view of some animals, 2020 was the year that people got less annoying. Have you heard of this term, the anthropause? Uh, no, like, oh no, no. This oh, wait, it just wait, because the the town because we all stayed indoors. Exactly that, because of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it was kind of the year that human activity was really super limited, and it was this. Um, this was kind of my favorite genre of pandemic story. Um, is there all of the, all of this interesting stuff happened like. Uh, 
like city rats that depend on restaurant mm-hmm. food had to change their scavenging yeah. territory. And all of these seismologists and marine researchers were like, well, at last the world is quiet. So we can go out and we can do all this great audio research. And there was one study about sparrows in the Bay Area that found that the, the males were changing their song because they no longer had to shout over traffic. So oh, wow. they, they could like do these more subtle, complex songs. And all of this made me wonder, like, Mary, are, are we the pest? Oh, we're that- definitely the, oh yeah, we, we, we are the pest of earth. <laughs> <laughs> we're definitely, I remember talking to somebody about um, Chernobyl and, and after, you know, after the incident you know, when, you know, no, no one came near for, and I think now there's even some tourism there. But um, apparently the wildlife just all moved back in and was thriving, even though there's, you know, some residual radiation. But uh, like humans were more of a plague than the radiation. Like the animals, <laughs> animals were doing much better now with the background radiation than they were with, you know, with people living there doing their things. So <laughs> I just yeah. read this article that just seems like a very Mary Roach study where p- people who wanted to study radiation, um, oh, at Fukushima Daiichi, not, not at Chernobyl, uh-huh. uh, but they were like, okay, what can we use to monitor how much radiation there is? And they were like, snakes, we're going to set snakes up with dosimeters and the snakes are going to crawl around. And that's going to give us our radiation reading in a place where it's not safe to, to send people in to do research. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> are snake do snakes are they able to do they are they not affected by radiation or is it just that nobody cares about snakes? No, I, I don't. I think they're okay. I think I they the research seemed to indicate that the the radiation was from them touching the ground, not from them. Like it wasn't internal. Oh, it wasn't from what I they see. were eating. The, I think the snakes were okay. Oh uh, yeah yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're just so yeah, weird think, research tool. <laughs> yeah, the um, after the you know on the, the Marshall Islands and the Bikini Atoll and all that where they did the. Um, atomic testing, the rodents kind of just went underground and they, they were fine. Huh. The rats, the rats prevailed. All right. Well, um, I, we're getting close to, uh, to reader question time. Uh, I just, I had one last question for you from me, which is whether or not writing this book kind of changed your perspective on anything other than perhaps uh, silverfish. <laughs> <laughs> it did not change my perspective on silverfish. I still find them incredibly creepy. Um, I should just do my next book should be about silverfish. No, no, uh, please, no, please, no. <laughs> it illustrated like a coffee table book. No, <laughs> yes, big blow ups, massive blow ups, lots like, of them seething, hundreds of them. Um, I guess silverfish are very roachable. I mean, I suppose yeah, they, they, are. they are, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, um, I, I think that the animals that we, you know, the, the ones that the, the little guys that don't get all the press, I mean, the, you know, bears and cougars get a tremendous amount of attention uh, from, from the media and from people who love them. I mean, they're big, they're beautiful. There aren't that many of them. So uh, we care a lot about them. A lot of people care a lot about them and that's great. And that should be, but I think, um, you know, the, the little guys like the roof rat, the squirrels that, you know, they're, 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 they're sort of, and birds, so, you know, they're, they're, they're thought of as, I guess, just people because they annoy people and because there seem like there are so many of them. We are so quick to, um, I think I mentioned this earlier, actually, we're just so quick to um, just call someone in to deal with it. And they're intelligent creatures and they're, be- they're beautiful in their own way. Okay, sewer rats, not maybe not so much. The roof rat. the rats are kind of cute. The rats, rats they are, cute. are in there and they're intelligent. And roof rats are very cute. They're, you, I, I, I mean, if you don't have, if you don't look at the tails, it's very hard to tell a squirrel from a roof rat. They're, they're very cute. And uh, yeah, the squirrels are you know, just as likely to pass on disease as the roof rats. So, uh, so, so I, you know, I've, I've, I feel, I've ended up feeling kind of bad for those guys, the little guys. So I'm a little, I'm much more uh, insistent on, you know, not setting a trap on, you know, on if something's getting in, figuring out how it's getting in and, you know, blocking the space that it's getting in, making sure it doesn't have babies in there. And like, you're going to separate the mother from the babies and what. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think that's kind of where, um, I kind of moved further along the spectrum. Well, um, are you ready for some questions from the, from the audience? 
Oh, yeah, 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 sure. Okay, they're starting to come in. Um, okay. okay. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So um, first one, much has been said about how humans are wrecking the world and killing off animal populations. Uh, but I, I think I think this question means like people of our era, mo modern humans are wrecking the world and killing off uh, populations. But they want to know like if earlier in history, if indigenous populations coexisted with the natural world before colonization, they want to know if that's a, a fair assessment. I just, I just did an event with this woman. Uh, I forget her name, but she wrote this book called the searching for the mother tree or the wisdom of the mother tree. Anyway, she spends time up in the islands off British Columbia. And she uh, was talking about how it's, it sounded like a beautiful book. She was talking about how the um, indigenous people up there, how they caught salmon and they were very, they were very careful to, you know, the, the large salmon, they never would take those. They only took the smaller ones, the way they caught them. Um, uh, it, it, it was a sustainable approach back before anybody talked about sustainability. And of course, the, the salmon populations are dwindling now. So uh, <clears throat> I'm, not, I'm not an expert on that, but based on what she was talking about, at least in that region of the world, uh, yes, the answer is yeah, yes, they, they were had figured out ways to, um, to, you know, to, to, of course they were taking some of them to eat, but all, but, but not just, you know, plowing through the whole population and wiping them out. So, yeah. This is, um, this is sort of a funny one. Uh, so somebody says in your reporting, you typically find someone whose name matches their job or their area of research. Uh, now you're a roach writing about pests. What was your favorite name you learned in writing fuzz? Uh, oh gosh, <clears throat> let me think if I can remember if there was. Um, I think it's called know, we, an aptonym we, when somebody's name and their job are the same. I forget what the word is. There is a word. That's probably it. Um, and there were so many of them in Gulp. There was there was there was Keith Grime from the soap and detergent industry. <laughs> <laughs> the you know the soap and detergent association. Keith Grime. <laughs> uh, 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 spits, the guy spits. We were I was talking about the enzymes in saliva. Like everywhere I turned, there was one. I can't think of one from this book. Do you remember any, Kara? No, I can't. I can't think of one from this book. But spits and grime are classic. So, <laughs> <laughs> and my own, my own um, gastroenterologist who you know did my colonoscopy, Dr. Turdeman. <laughs> Maybe I mean, he's maybe he's in the audience. He's at UCSF. He's probably so sick of me talking about. His name. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had one from this book. I know that there's a there is a um, somebody who works for like the I don't know. It's an animal person, and her name is an animal, but I forget which animal. So that's not interesting. <laughs> so, yeah, I failed. The, I failed this question. That's all right. We 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 will move on to the next. I don't actually know the answer to this question. Maybe you will. Somebody wants to know: Is there science that supports why we find empathy for some animals more, uh, for some animals more than we do for others? Why are squirrels less gross than rats? Um, I uh, there probably is some science to that. There's some. There has to be something about <clears throat> why we can't stand the naked tail. Like po possums have the naked tail and rats, and there's something that seems to freak us out. Maybe it's related to the silverfish thing. I don't know. Yeah, maybe I was thinking if maybe it's related to snakes. There's been all this research into why does the movement of snakes freak mm -hmm. people out so much? Uh, it's it's not maybe, a very yeah. human movement. Um, yeah. I do know there's this. Have you heard of the? You've heard of the phrase charismatic megafauna, yes. right? Which is yeah. like yeah. whales, and whales and bears. And yes. And, yeah. Uh -huh. All the animals yeah. that we love. And I've always liked the idea that those animals can sort of be ambassadors for the other animals that we're not as excited about. If you preserve yeah. their habitat, you sort of preserve exactly. the habitat yeah. for everybody. Exactly, because no one gets excited about the eight gilled hagfish or whatever. The, <laughs> <laughs> the, the delta smelt. It's disappearing. We need to save the, the smelt. Uh, yeah, so so yes, you need those those flagship species, yeah. Somebody out there, make a Save the Smelts t-shirt, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, well, so this is, a, this is a, a question we sort of went over, but um, a little specific. Did any of your findings change your way of thinking about, like, will you still call mosquitoes pests? Do you still think that they are, you know, you know like a, a varmint? Um, 
I, I have to say mosquitoes, I, I don't think that I, my needle budged very far on the mosquito, like the silverfish. Um, that's a tough one. Um, there was a study, there was a study, I'm going to, I'm going to share this just because it's, it's me pretending I have an answer. There was a study where they, uh, there was a survey. Oh gosh, I'm going to say the seventies, where they had people describe their feelings for all these different species. And, um, the number of people, yeah, I was just making the point that over time, people, uh, are, have much more positive, uh, ratings for um, a lot of wildlife <laughs> and, um, the one, yeah, you know, they because they redid the survey uh, in the '90s. So it was like 25 years went by. They redid the same survey, and interestingly, the uh, cockroach had moved up from <laughs> least appealing, most despised. It was now the second, uh, and the the mosquito had taken the taken the place Ooh. as the most most disliked creature. Yeah. Wow, oh. that doesn't answer the question, and I no. still don't. Don't like mosquitoes. But. but I mean, that's a way of saying that people people change their opinion about what they think of as a pest. I was shocked that something, some of the animals that you described as pests, like ducks, I never would have thought of a duck as a pest. Yeah, yeah. A or duck. a cormorant. I think, yeah, the, the things that, you know, people go bird watching. oh, it's a, it's a cormorant. And I mean, just the, 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 that could be a pest, you know, or, or a bobcat or a chipmunk. I mean, chipmunks, you know, they get into the rafters. I, I know, I, I guess I know that. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's um, anyway, mosquitoes, you know what the problem with the mosquito, it, it, it's too hard to catch it, you know, it, you, to, to catch it and take it out. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm now re-examining what's wrong with me that I'm so awful to mosquitoes that I, that I, you know, smash them, but it's partly they're so hard. You can't do the thing you do with a spider where you put the, you know, you put the glass over it and you slide the paper under it. You can't do that. Yeah. And the silverfish, they're very quick too. I'm sure that's probably. That is exactly what I did to the silverfish. There is, there's a great older episode of Radio Lab called Kill Em All, which is about gene drive and mosquitoes. And what they did was they sent their reporter out to find like one good thing to say about the mosquito. You yeah. know, it could, could it be doing something for its environment? Maybe it's just biomass that something else eats. And they just struggled to find one good thing to say about the mosquito. So I understand. I think, I think uh... Uh, don't birds eat a lot of mosquitoes? Birds and bats, don't they? Uh, uh, isn't them, aren't mosquitoes a pretty significant food source? I don't know. They they do, but apparently mosquitoes are really small. You need you need just a lot of mosquitoes. yeah. There's not a lot of meat. Look at that. Oh, yeah, yeah, not a lot no. of meat on a mosquito. All right, somebody. Uh, okay, okay, somebody says, are there any <laughs> animal crimes that didn't make the cut for the book? Yes. Oh, nobody's asked this before. Good one. Ah. Okay. Um, I did. Think about a chapter that had to do with, um, okay, in a word, rape. And it, it had to do with some of the swim with the dolphin programs because apparently uh, some of the male dolphins would get quite kind of amorously aggressive with uh, some of the tourists. And so they, the male dolphins have quietly been phased out of these programs. Oh, gosh. Where people swim with the dolphins. But it was a little too, too. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was, little, it was like border. It was like stepping into bestiality a little bit, and <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah. I mean, I, and I, and also I didn't. There wasn't anybody. There was no science or research. It was just kind of a, a policy shift and a realization that this was happening. So, um, but I did go so far as to uh, uh, I think Scripps or or what's the one on the East Coast, the Oceanographic Institute. They had some files on it. I was going to go to the archive. That was something I think COVID. Like I just you know. I think it's out near Martha's Vineyard. Is it Woods Hole? And it was, huh? Is it Woods yeah, Woods Hole. Hole. Yeah, yeah, Woods Hole. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, so uh, it was partly because the trip didn't work out, but also it just it was it felt a little, felt a little, a little too much. Weird, a little too much. Yeah. All right. So but anyway, wants- good. See, I just I just <laughs> killed. I don't know what that was. It was a fruit fly, I think. I just killed it. <laughs> Oh, oh no, wait, wait. There he is. Oh, it's back. Oh, I missed it again. You're again. unrepentant. It's a, it's a fruit fly. <laughs> it only has a day to live. So I uh, you know, it's not gonna notice. Very short, <laughs> short lifespan anyway. 
Somebody mm-hmm. wants to know, um, since you can track mountain lions now, have you tried tracking them <laughs> near your home when you return from your travels? Uh, I, uh, after I got back from that trip, when I would go hiking, I was a really annoying hiking partner because I, anytime, you know, if, the, if it had been raining, if the, if the uh, trail was at all muddy and then there were foot, there were tracks, I'd be like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to see if I can, I want to see if I can identify. And there are always dogs. <laughs> it's just like, okay, it's another dog. So I, so I dropped it. Um, I, and I, uh, but I, yeah, I was looking, I, I definitely spent some time, uh, with my head down on the trail. Not, not, I mean, my gaze down on the trail looking for, uh, tracks that might be interesting. Cause I kind of thought, Ooh, maybe I'll be one of those tracker people, but I'm hopeless at it. So I, I can, you know, tell a dog from a cow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's pretty good. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Better, better than I can do. <laughs> Uh, there's a question in here for me that says, when is your next book coming out? And that is clearly from my agent. And the answer <laughs> is when I think of the idea. But uh, <laughs> okay, somebody wants to know a uh, question for Mary. You've tackled the human body and now animals. So what is next? Uh, I may be returning to the human body. I, I mean, I, I have a proposal but, uh, that I have my agent has seen, but my publisher has not. So uh, I'm, I don't know yet. They may decide that they are not interested, but um, I, I, I think I may be circling back to the, the human oh, body. Is there a new part? A new part? It's not, know, yeah, no, it's not a part. It's not a, it's not a part. It's not, although I, I do hear from people going hair, you need to do a book on hair <laughs> or skin. That- I get skin, skin a lot. Skin is, people ask about skin. There's several very good books about the natural history of skin. Is that That's where you were heading the, with the uh, the hair library trip? No, 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 no. I, it wasn't. Uh, no, no, no. Not, not, not that. Not not uh, not part of hair. That was no. That was just me grasping at. I don't know. What is this? Maybe there's something here. Yeah, <laughs> in there. Uh, all right. Let's see. I think we are out of audience questions. Unless someone wants to okay. sneak in real quick, no. I can ask. Yeah. Right. I think that's, I think we've got through uh, the, the questions that were in my queue. Thank cool. you so much to the audience for uh, your amazing questions. So now there is a tra- tradition at Inforum of asking a, a closing question uh, to the author, which is, um, what is your 60 second idea to change the world? So Mary, what do okay. you think? Okay. Okay. It's not a big thing, but it's something that I would love to see happen. And that is uh, globally. Uh, no more glue traps. Okay. Just no more glue traps. That's a really nasty thing to do. And they're uh, uh, in Europe. They don't, they don't allow them. I mean, you can still get them on the internet, but like, you know, Amazon stop selling them. Just stop it. Gross. You know, just a lingering, horrible thing that we would do to a small animal. Stop it. No glue traps. (laughs) All right. Excellent. No glue trap. That that can be the other T-shirt that we take. Into this. <laughs> <laughs> what was the first one? I forget uh, the first T-shirt. Save the smelt. Oh, save the smelt. Okay. Yeah, all right. Save the smelt. No more glue traps. Okay, I'm going to start a, a nonprofit. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that is going to be a yeah, that is going to be a really interesting dual mission. <laughs> yeah. Well. Thank you so much, Mary, for joining me today on Inform at the Commonwealth Club. It has been so fun to talk to you. I just want to remind everybody who's watching that um, that Mary's book, Fuzz, When Nature Breaks the Law, is out now. And um, if you would like to learn more about the Commonwealth Club or look at other uh, past virtual programs, you can visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. Thank you so much, Mary. It's been a treat. Oh, thank you so much, Kara. I loved chatting with you and the Commonwealth Club is uh, one of my favorite places in San Francisco. So it's lovely to virtually connect uh, with the people that are out there somewhere. Uh, Thank you all for joining in and uh, hopefully next time we'll be in person. I hope so too. Um, For everybody here, uh, I'm Kara Platoni. Thank you all and have a great night.